All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about art in Southern Italy. So thank you for joining me. This is um, one of the free classes that we are offering on Facebook Live and on YouTube. And it's part of a larger program that we just launched this year called the Feast on History Food and Wine School. So we were uh, scheduled to launch an official school in Italy, in Southern Italy, where um, we bring our tour guests normally. And as part of our tours, we always have really interesting art history program, which I lead, but it of course involves local guides. Um, so when that couldn't happen that this year for obvious reasons, we decided to move these programs online. So we completed a, a six week program that we called the virtual vacation in Southern Italy. And we had six weeks worth of cooking classes, uh, wine tastings and art history classes. And they were, really a, a big hit. Uh, you know, it was kind of all an experiment. I wasn't sure exactly how it would go, but it turned out to be a big hit. And so we were, we, we received lots of requests to continue on. And so that is what we are doing. So the Feast on History Food and Wine School is a subscription program um, and it has many, many programs within it. So there's a wine class, there is a cooking series called Mastering the Mediterranean Diet. Um, and then there is this art history program, which is my personal baby. So my name is Danielle O'Terry. Um, I'm an art historian by training. My expertise is the Renaissance in Naples. I actually studied, I did my first year of graduate school in Florence, Italy, and of course I loved it because any sentient human being would. <laughs> and um, discovered that the, the Renaissance in Naples was this huge unexplored topic. And I found it really interesting because my roots, of course, are in Southern Italy, um, as are most Italian Americans and Canadians and Australians. And there's so little known about this period and uh, or this region really, and why. So one of the reasons that I, that I discovered was that Southern Italy was so badly damaged during war, World War II that it really wasn't a hospitable place for scholars to study. So when you're an art historian, you have to write a thesis um, that's hopefully going to be published and, and your entire career is really contingent on this. It's one of, it's the biggest hoop you have to jump in order to pass into the world of academia. But what happened at, during World War II is that as the German forces were retreating from the allies, they dropped bombs on the state archives of Naples, which at that time was the largest repository of medieval and ancient documents in all of Europe, and they were destroyed. And so a scholar who's trying to be um, productive and, and, and write from original uh, primary source documents has a pretty hard time doing so in Naples. So me always being the uh, fan of impossible tasks <laughs> decided to take this on. And um, over the years since then, this was uh, 18 years ago, I have really, um, been diving in continuously to the art and architecture of Southern Italy, which is extraordinary. And uh, something I'm very, very passionate about, something that should be of great interest to people who, like me, have an Italian American background, because these things are really part of our cultural heritage as well. And that's what I'm gonna show you tonight. So what we're gonna do is kind of a, a crash course in Southern Italian art and architecture, just to introduce you to some of the big things that maybe you Maybe you've seen some of these things, you've heard something about them. Maybe they'll be entirely new. And then uh, I will open things up for questions at the end. You can leave comments as well along the way. I'll be able to see them as I'm talking. So what I'm gonna do now is share my screen. Uh, let's see, give me one second. Chrome tab, or in Southern Italy slides, share. And let me pop this into presentation mode. And away we go. Okay, so first up is the Castel Nuovo in Naples. Why do I start here? Well, two reasons. Number one was my thesis. <laughs> uh, this castle that you see here, you know, these big turrets. I mean, this looks like a like a Shrek fairy tale castle. This was built by the Angevins, the French, who had invaded and who ruled in. Naples in the 1200s, the 1300s. And then in the 1400s, 1442, they were kicked out 
by the Aragonese. So the first thing to know about Southern Italian art and architecture is that it is often grouped in with French art or Spanish art because these were the people who ruled Southern Italy, what we call either the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily or the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. So sort of one thing first to be aware of. My dog Rocco is all of a sudden very interested in what I'm doing. He couldn't have carried less five minutes ago. I'm busy, Rocco. So this tower, this, uh, excuse me, the towers of the castle that you see here are this giant fortress castle. And then in the center is this um, arch that has, that was put in by the Renaissance ruler, Alfonso V of Aragon, who became Alfonso the I of Naples. Now, I can talk at length about this. It, it's an amazing space. So much interesting history happened here. It's a, a beautiful place to visit. Um, in the class that we'll be doing as part of the larger program, I'm actually going to have one of my guides in Naples walk people through there with a uh, the selfie stick so you can see it. But I also chose this picture to show you because of this crane that you see out front. So they are building a subway line um, to connect specifically the train station in Naples to the port of Naples where people take boats to go out to Capri and Ischia. And as they were doing this construction project, they found some cool stuff. I'll show you what that discovery is. It's these three Roman longboats. These were, as, as they were excavating for the subway, found here pretty much intact. There were even little pairs of leather shoes that were inside the boats. So just an absolutely extraordinary discovery. So what happened was, of course, the construction crews stopped. They had to call the archaeological authorities who came, and the project had to be halted. Um, but this is to say that this is also not actually terribly unusual in Naples. Naples is a city that was built layer upon layer upon layer. So we have the Greek layer, think of it like a cake. The Greek layer, then the Roman, then the medieval, then the Baroque. Um, Naples in the 1700s was the most sophisticated in city, uh, city in Europe next only to Paris. So there's a tremendous amount of history there. And if you stick a shovel in the ground, you're probably gonna find something. So these Roman boats are something that I'm actually learning more about now. and, and the archaeologists who found them are learning about them now too. So I will be dedicating one of our courses, uh, one of our classes within the larger co course I'm calling Art in Southern Italy um, to these boats. And it's really going to be a journey of discovery as much for me as it will be for the viewers. And I'm going to try to bring in some people who um, have maybe looked at them much more closely. So next, we're going to go to Pestum. The three most intact temples, Greek temples in the world, are not in Greece. They are in southern Italy. So this is about an hour and a half from Naples. This is right near the Feast on History Food and Wine School. We are in the town of Capaccio Pestum. Uh, Capaccio is in the mountains, Pestum is on the plains. And these Greek temples were built in the sixth century, beginning in the sixth century BC, when this area was all part of Greece. This was a Greek colony. And these are temples that are dedicated to Hera. Uh, in the past, they were believed to be dedicated to Poseidon. Um, they're, they're very well known, they're very famous, uh, but there's still a ton of, of exploration that goes on all the time, um, and especially in the past couple of years. So I'll show you here an aerial view. You can see that there are three temples. Um, and there's a whole archaeological site in which they sit. So there were homes, there was a swimming pool, there was gymnasiums, um, other points of worship, an amphitheater, uh, all on this site, as well as a large necropolis. What's a necropolis? It's a place where the dead were buried. It's a cemetery, essentially. And that is one of the most fascinating things in Pesto. So here is a tomb painting from a group of people who lived in this area called the Lucanians. And the Lucanians were a tribe who uh, came from central Italy and they actually fought, they lived there in between the period of the Greeks and the Romans. So this is in about three, 300s BC. Um, and they left behind just 
uh, such vivid tomb paintings like this one here where you can see these beautiful faces. You see this bearded man who's the older greeting the younger one who has just arrived here in the afterlife. And you can see their hands as they're meeting. So here we're looking back at people who lived thousands of years ago and yet the gesture is so human and so familiar. And so the Lucanian tombs are also a relatively new area of exploration. Many of these were just discovered in the 1960s. Many of them have just are actually still in storage. They're not on public display. Um, there are certain times when the museum will open up the storage for people to see them, which is when I got to see them and take this picture. Um, but there is so much to learn. And what I like about studying the Lucanians and talking about them and sharing their story with you is that this is a chance to really see the lives of people that live there. You know, what do they like to do? What did they, what were their relationships like? What did they like to eat? Um, how tall were they? Very short, by the way, very, very short, like less than five feet tall. All of these things, we can really look at their lives um, by looking at the paintings that they left behind that have been excavated. Uh, there's a close up of those hands greeting each other, which I just, I just think are so beautiful. All right, Matera and the cave of the original sin. Now, this is a place where I actually have not, uh, I've not been able to visit myself. But I have studied this at length. Um, my area of specialty in graduate school was the Renaissance in Naples. But then I went on to work at the Cloisters, which is a museum of medieval art. It's a branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I worked and lectured for about 15 years. And I still remain the program director of the International Center of Medieval Art, which is to say, this art, this medieval art that was created in the eighth century by monks who were Christianizing, uh, they were, it, you know, pilgrims Christianizing the locals in the area who were still worshiping the Roman pantheon. Um, they painted this, the paintings you see in this cave. And it was discovered really in the 1960s. There, there was some record of somebody discovering it in the 19th century, but in the 1960s was when attention really came to it. And it actually had been a place where locals were just um, sheltering their sheep. And of course, now it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the more stunning places to visit uh, because of very, very unique images like this. This is an image of the Virgin Mary. I mean, look at that outfit. Look at that hat. <laughs> this um, really shows us like what these Byzantine monks were. You know, this isn't a giant public commission for church on behalf of the Pope like Michelangelo. This was really art that was meant to communicate to the local people who, again, were not Christians. They were still worshiping the Roman pantheon. So how to speak to them, how to communicate to them in their language. And that includes the fashion that would represent royalty and importance. So because I haven't actually been in this cave myself, I've only studied it from afar, I am going to invite an, uh, a special guest on for this particular class on the cave of the original sin, somebody who has been there, to give us a sensory journey of what it's like to see it. All right, I am cruising right through here, guys. One of the most unique, most interesting places in Italy is on the island of Sicily. And it's a cathedral called Monreale. So it's really just right outside Palermo, like 15 minutes outside Palermo, if that, very, very, very close. And this was the seat of the Norman kings of Sicily. So who are the Normans? The Normans came from what is Normandy now in Northern France. They were descendants of the Vikings and they had conquered Southern Italy. The story is, is they had come to Southern Italy uh, on a pilgrimage, on a religious pilgrimage to see the cave of St. Michael in the Abruzzo region, which is really sort of South Central Italy. Um, you might be familiar with Mont Saint-Michel in uh, Normandy. And so therefore Michael, St. Michael was very important to the Normans. And so it would make sense that they might come here on a pilgrimage. The truth is the more likely story is that they were actually hired mercenaries. They were really good fighters. And they were brought to Southern Italy to rout out the Byzantines, the Byzantines being Greeks during the Middle Ages. And they were very successful. And they set up their kingdom in Palermo. 
Now, the people that were occupying, that were ruling Palermo before this were the Arabs and uh, from North Africa. They had a very sophisticated, well-developed culture and a very sort of multicultural place as well. There were Jewish communities, Arab communities, uh, Christian communities. The Normans came in and they really created a very integrated kingdom. So it's become something that a lot of scholars have come to more recently because it is sort of this incredible anomaly of multiculturalism that works uh, in history. There's not often a lot of places where you can find that. Um, it was, it's a difficult area to study. When I was in graduate school, I actually got really fast, fascinated by this and uh, I wanted to study this as a, as a main thesis topic. But then I learned that I was probably going to have to learn Arabic if I wanted to dig into it the way I wanted to. And, you know, life is short. <laughs> so I, I chose to stick with Naples and what I already could conquer. Um, but what we see when we study the art is the integration of these Arab arabesque forms, which you can see on the outside of the cathedral here. And then on the inside, we have the integration of these mosaics, which were done likely by Byzantine artisans. And they are mind blowing. Uh, I saw them for the first time 20 years ago when I was traveling around Sicily backpacking. And I, I was sort of overwhelmed by them and I didn't know that much about them at the time. So it was more just an experience of like, wow, look at all the beautiful shiny things. But I hadn't really studied this period that much at that point. I was so fascinated that I came home and then I fell in love with this and really began to study it. Um, and then last year while leading a tour, I got to see them again. And it was really tremendous. The only problem was there was a wedding starting. <laughs> and so they kicked us out of the cathedral early. So I didn't get to spend as much time as I wanted to. But we're going to delve into this. Uh, we're going to have a class solely dedicated to these mosaics. Um, so we can see here, this is the guide actually pointing up at the ceiling where the mosaics are, <clears throat> or the upper register here. And then on the right, or on the left on your side, um, that's where the screen is mirroring. You can see there's an image of Christ. Uh, you can see the apostles in the boat and look at the way the water is formed in these beautiful swirls. It's so, I mean, it, it's, it's like beautiful graphic design as well as beautiful uh, composition. And this is all made with mosaic tiles. So little bits of broken glass, which were all put together and laid piece by piece by piece. Now each piece of glass is probably a quarter of an inch large. Oh, sorry, my screen jumped ahead. Kind of preview, what's coming next? Um, you have, a, a, yeah, you could just a quarter of an inch all cut ahead of time, all prepared ahead of time and laid piece by piece. So this is a topic I'm really looking forward to sharing. It's mind boggling, it's fun, it's like a giant storybook. There's a lot to discover here. Okay. Pompeii, of course, is probably the most famous site in Southern Italy. A lot of people don't even realize where it is. It's just so iconic. It's like Pompeii, you always knew that that existed. Um, so Pompeii is about 30 minutes outside of Naples. You get there by taking a, basically a commuter rail. It's called the Circumvesuviana out there. And when you're, if you go at the right time, you realize you're on there with the commuters, people who live sort of in the suburbs around Naples. And it stops at a few different places. And Pompeii is just one of the sites. Now this week on August 24th was the day that we call Pompeii Day. Traditionally, we accept that on August 24th, 79 AD, Vesuvius erupted and the city of Pompeii was destroyed along with the city of Herculaneum and other nearby towns. There's a series of villas uh, big fancy residences, imagine this like Malibu, that were also destroyed during the eruption of Vesuvius. And that date comes to us from uh, the Roman writer Pliny. And while in fact there has been some debate based on the translations and some really geeky details, which I will go into in more detail in a later class, um, it was always accepted to be August 24th, but archaeology continues here and now that date is debated. So it's specifically tell you why they figured out 
that it was probably in late October. So this is an image here of a place called the Villa Aplantis. It is very, very close to the main site of Pompeii, but it is a different train step. You get off at a place called Torre Annunziata. And it looks like, a, you know, just a little town with a bunch of apartment buildings, really nothing special on the surface. And then you walk in and into the town a little bit and you find the archeological site. So this was a giant villa with over 90 rooms that was, again, like a house in Malibu for the uber wealthy who would come down here for the summer and they would bring their friends and they would have wild parties and there would be servants living here. And when Vesuvius erupted, the house was actually empty. Somebody had moved out and there were scaffolds in place that indicate that somebody was getting ready to move in and they were making some repairs. So let me move forward to the next slide. Uh, there was also a house just next door that seemed to be a warehouse. Now the, the, the Roman, um, lifestyle was such that in Rome, you were supposed to be very austere and conservative and not gaudy. You weren't supposed to show off. You were supposed to live with a certain sense of dignity. But when people went down to the Vesuvius coast, this was like going to Miami. This is where they went to have a lot of fun. But still on the surface, they always had to be demonstrating to their fellow countrymen that they were industrious. And so often at these very lavish villas, they had uh, some sort of farm, um, to kind of justify the lavishness, to say like, we're not just throwing parties down here, uh, we're making something, we're doing something productive. And so this warehouse directly next door to the villa was seems to be um, a place for shipping wine. And so what you see here in this slide are all of these amphora. Amphora were these ceramic vases that were used for transporting wine, for olive oil, and for something called garum, which is fish sauce. So if you're like familiar with Asian fish sauce or even the Italian colatura, it was like a much funkier version of that. It was a popular condiment that the Romans ate a lot of. Um, the amphora have been studied. Now at Villa Oplantis, which has is being explored by a team of archeologists that's actually led by uh, an American group from the University of Texas at Austin who go there every summer, but not this summer. Um, they have been doing prodigious work and it's not just digging and, and looking at art and architecture. It's something called osteoarchaeology, studying the bones of the group of people that were actually found in this villa all in one room. One of the women was two weeks away from giving birth. So there's an entire fetal skeleton as well. Um, they were waiting by a door probably for rescue by the Roman Navy and a tsunami probably took over that boat and they died there. So you have osteoarchaeologists, you have archaeologists that work um, only with aquaculture and are looking to see, it seems as though there was also a fish farm associated with the space as well. Um, and then all a, a variety of different bioarchaeologists. And what they discovered in this second villa was that all of these amphora were filled with wine. New wine, Romans didn't age their wine, they drank it right away, they watered it down very often too. Uh, so how, if this was August 24th, could there be all of this wine in the amphora? And the other thing that they found were pomegranates. Pomegranates to the Mediterranean are like pumpkins are to us in North America, they are a sign of the fall. And uh, they're usually uh, harvested in late September People would uh, dry pomegranates because the skins were often used to dye fishnets. And they found all of these pomegranates that were still spread out on mats, on drying mats. And so they were being dried for the, for eventually being used as dyes. So that changes the date. Now it's funny because these are kind of like almost mundane details, things that would be easy to pass over and not think too deeply about, but this is what, I love about archaeologists is that they think really deeply about all sorts of little minutia um, that turn out to completely change history. All right. I forget if I put another slide. Oh, yeah, there's the pomegranates. This is a um, bowl of fruit that's, that's a fresco painting. And you can see that the bowl that it's in, it's this glass bowl, is transparent. The frescoes in this villa are really amazing. The, whoever the artist was, 
worked in many other villas. Uh, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there's a small room called the Cupiculum that comes from another villa that was nearby this, but in the forest. And you see a very, very similar bowl of fruit. So we can probably safely assume that there was a workshop of artists who were very well paid, that the real housewives of the Vesuvius Coast all wanted to hire to decorate their homes. And uh, this beautiful bowl of pomegranates here is, is very, very well intact. Now, the reason it's so difficult to achieve this in fresco paint is that it is not translucent the way oil paint is. Fresco is a bed of wet plaster. Um, and then the artist applies pigment that is ground and mixed with egg yolk to make it viscous directly into the bed of wet plaster. So when it dries, the painting is now not on the wall, it is the wall. So there's very, very little room to, there's no room actually to fix things. With oil paint, it takes very long to dry and you build a very, very, very thin layers of glaze. Light penetrates the glaze and you can get all these beautiful luminous effects and you can create the illusion of transparency. But to do that with fresco, crazy hard, really, really hard. So this is a beautiful place and uh, we will, in the Art in Southern Italy course, be dedicating a class to uh, this villa, which we did in the last class as well, but I'll go a little bit more deeper for those who are repeating it. Um, and then we will be looking at lots of other places in Pompeii. Pompeii is massive. It's an entire city. So we've got, you know, the stories of rich people and poor people, and we have a whole room that was probably uh, the property of a cult, <laughs> the, the villa of the mystery. So we're going to look at what kind of a cult was going on in there. Um, so we will intermittently continue to bring Pompeii back into the story. Um, and very much with a curious mind because it's still being discovered. It is certainly the greatest repository of Roman history in the world. And um, I have many friends, many gods in Italy who hopefully will be able to also take us inside there as well. While I am unable to get over there, let's see what we got next. Other topics that we will be covering because there's so much. The Royal Palace of Caserta. Uh, if you know the Palace of Naboo in Star Wars, I don't know which one of the Star Wars, I'm not really into Star Wars, but my husband got really excited, Christian got really excited when uh, he was here. Uh, this is the Palace of Naboo. The C Royal Palace of Caserta belonged to the Bourbon Dynasty. Um, so this was built in the 1700s and uh, was where the Queen Maria Carolina lived. Maria Carolina was born in Austria and she is the sister, was the sister of Marie Antoinette. And when the French, uh, it, when the French Revolution broke out, of course, Marie Antoinette, we know famously was killed, even though she never did say, let them eat cake. And that broke Maria Carolina's heart. And at that point, the French were beginning their invasions of Northern Italy. There was a Neapolitan revolution in 1799 that was led by the French that Carol Maria Carolina may have otherwise been on board with had her sister not been killed. And so the revolution goes awry and only lasts five months. This is a story I've been studying a lot lately. I've been working on some writing about it. Um, and of course, having been to the Royal Palace at Caserta, this unbelievably opulent place, it is an interesting study and something that is, um, it, it, on one hand, just this, tremendous uh, point of pride for Southern Italians. This is, I think, two or three times the size of Versailles. Uh, it has incredible silks, um, highest forms of painting, architecture. It is, is incredibly sophisticated. It's really amazing that it's not a more famous tourist site. Um, and it's also a place where when you walk around inside and you're just looking at the ceilings that are 30 feet high and the tremendous expense that went into everything where you're like, oh, I get why people eat the rich every once in a while. Like, I get it. <laughs> so it's it's both. And we, we can look at it from all different angles, but certainly we'll look at it for its artistic value as well. I have a lot of pictures from having been there a few times. Um, but again, I will be inviting some of my colleagues to share their perspective and their images about it as well. Uh, this is also something I have just recently started to learn about. The Abruzzo is, as I mentioned before, in south central Italy. It is a very rural area. 
very famous for its national park, for really, really good cheese, <laughs> lots of sheep in Abruzzo. Um, and not terribly famous for artistic treasures. Um, and it's filled with just lots of extremely remote little towns that are hard to access. And like Matera, where I showed you the cave of the original sin, you have lots of places where there were monks who were Christianizing the local people and created art that was really meant to communicate directly to the people. So not to glorify the Pope, not on the behest of the king, but really to communicate to very, very humble, poor people who lived in agrarian life. And this little chapel, the Oratoria San Pellegrino, is called the Sistine Chapel of the Abruzzo. Um, you have to take a bit of a hike to get there. And it's something that, um, in contrast to the beautiful and overwhelming nature in this area that is this little jewel box and very beloved by many of my colleagues. I have lots of colleagues who work in Abruzzo and have a really special love for it. So I'm gonna invite them to share their experience of being in this place as well. All right. And the Museo di Capo di Monte in Naples, one of my favorite topics. I wrote about the museum for Condé Nast Traveler a couple of years ago when they were in the middle of a res uh, renovation. It is the largest art museum in Italy, not just in Southern Italy, in all of Italy. So people wait online forever for the Uffizi, and of course it's worth it, you know, Botticelli's birth of Venus, all of that there, it's amazing. But <laughs> Capo di Monte is usually kind of empty. And there are treasures like this one here, Parmigianino's Antea, um, and many, many others that are here. There's lots of famous works that are in, you know, they're in the museum. There's not any special crowd around them. It's not like when you go to the Louvre and you know you're getting close to the Mona Lisa because there's a giant crowd assembled there. And then you stumble upon something and you're like, oh, I, that's, that's famous. I know that thing. That's super famous. It's a little bit outside the city, there is a park in Naples called Capo di Monte, top of the mountain, or hat of the mountain, head of the mountain. It's kind of like the central park of Naples. It's a place where if you live in the city, you might go hang out there, have a picnic, bring your dog up to the dog run. And it was a place where the, um, the, the building that it's in was an old bourbon hunting lodge. You know, the idea of lodge <laughs> means one thing to me and meant something very different to the Bourbon monarchy. It's an enormous palace and the art collection was eventually installed there. Um, much of the art collection belonged to the royals originally, so some of it didn't have very far to go. So there's everything from uh, paintings, classics, great masters, uh, medieval paintings, to an Andy Warhol of Mount Vesuvius that is there. So I will take you inside the Museo di Capo di Monte. Um, I'll also take you to the Archaeological Museum of Naples, which, if, you know, I only get to go to one museum for the rest of my life. It would be that one. So. Um, go back to my slides. So if you want to join me and look more deeply into these things, uh, the way this works is it's going to be part of the Feast on History, Food and Wine School, our online portal, because we cannot travel right now. And we don't know when that's going to change. We build out an online school. So we're going to continue to do some of these classes on Facebook. Um, this is also being broadcast to YouTube. I like to just get on and share knowledge because I'm a geek and it makes me happy <laughs> to uh, find new other people who do. But for for really going deep and for real interactivity, it's going to happen inside uh, our online school. So the way it works is you pay a subscription. You can do it by the month or you can just buy the whole year. The year obviously saves you a lot more money if that's what you want to do. And it's also like its own little Facebook. One of the, even though I'm on Facebook right now, one of the pieces of feedback that we got was that a lot of people don't wanna do Facebook. So we built a little world unto itself. Um, it's through a, a platform called Mighty Networks. And it's our own universe. When you log into it, and there's also an app, so you can use it on your phone as well if you like. Everything is in one place. So you can see this is one of the things that we have going on in addition to our uh, cooking classes or wine classes or art classes. We also have group events and meetups. You can see we're going to have the cookbook author, Domenica Marchetti, joining us in October. Um, but it's got an activity feed and you can ask questions and you can interact with us and interact with the other members as well. Um, these are all the classes that are included right now. We're going to continue to add things. 
I'm like a person who likes to make stuff. <laughs> I'm a creator. So I'm going to continue to add things. The cooking class, oh, sorry, the cooking classes are filmed at our school in Italy. And they really focus on traditional Mediterranean diet dishes, many of which are really healthy. Uh, Christian, my husband, is going to be leading Italian wine for the 99. This is art in Southern Italy, which I just walked you through tonight. And then the Arthur Avenue Cookbook Club. We also, of course, are the founders of Arthur Avenue Food Tours. And we will um, continue our recipe club inside this portal as well. Um, and of course, the membership you'll see if you go to the site, if you're interested, includes the main membership, which we're going to hopefully, again, make a really wonderful community. Uh, also, any course content, watching the videos, everything happens inside the app. So if you don't show up to something live or you want to watch something again or you want to Chromecast it to your TV, it actually Chromecasts, <laughs> uh, you can do that all from one place. So you're not hunting for Zoom links and you're not looking for Facebook links or emails. It's all going to be just in one single place. So hopefully very easy. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and want to see if anybody has any questions now that my dog has finally <laughs> settled down. <laughs> Tried to take him out right before this and it started pouring rain. Poured myself a beer. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any questions? Southern Italian art is something that is woefully understudied, as I mentioned at the beginning of this live stream, in large part because many scholars have not lived in Southern Italy. Southern Italy took a lot longer to recover after World War II, of course. Um, and, you know, scholars or PhD students, they want to live in a nice place like Florence and drink cappuccino while they're doing their graduate studies. But Southern Italy is something that's really kind of emerging. A lot of Italian scholars, especially, have, have been doing some really amazing work. Um, one of the treats for me is really sharing the work that they're doing because, you know, these None of us who went into history are, are doing it for the money. <laughs> We're doing it because we really, uh, you know, we, we find something special. We find a great joy in delving into the past and, and uncovering it and then sharing it. So even though tour guides in Italy right now are having a very, very difficult time um, not being able to work, not being able to make money, but also, too, many of the people that I talk to, they just say, it's awful. I can't. I can't do my thing. I can't talk about history. I'm sharing this as my joy. This is what makes me happy and I can't do any of that. So hopefully what we've done is create a place where that can continue to happen. Um, we don't know when travel is going to resume and I, I suspect that it's going to, it's not going to just be like one thunderous, happy, wonderful day where we're all going to be able to get a vaccine and go out again. Um, I think it's probably going to be in stages and there may be some people who won't be able to travel for a few years, depending on what's going on with their own personal health. Um, also, it was the question was posed to me before any of this broke out in last year's tour about uh, climate change and flying and, you know, is it really ethical to be promoting travel all this time? Is all of this travel really um, ethical in terms of carbon and also in terms of, like, overwhelming cities? I mean, the past few years, if you go to the Amalfi Coast, it's not that fun anymore. I mean, the Amalfi Coast is, of course, beautiful, but when it's just overrun by tourists, it's definitely, it loses something. Um, and so this hopefully, again, um, we really created this for the armchair traveler. So if you're looking to travel virtually in your mind, in your imagination, this will hopefully satisfy, scratch the ish, or help you prepare for a trip that maybe will be happening in a year or two years. We're not quite sure. Um, but I think that learning about history is always a worthwhile venture and there's always there's so much stuff on netflix <laughs> for zoning out and honestly sometimes i want to tune in i want to really engage and learn and to do so in a collaborative environment not just watching a video but being able to ask questions and be curious inside of a community so that's the goal that's what we're trying to create and we will continue to do some more of these on facebook if you have specific questions or things you would like to see um, you know, classes, topics that you'd like to cover. I really find, again, I mentioned before, a lot of Italian Americans are rediscovering their own heritage and learning about the culture that's, that goes along with it. Send me an email. You see on, uh, there's feastonhistory.com. 
if you click on the website, my address is there. It's just danielle at feastonhistory.com. Let me know, because then I can shape future live streams like this. Um, question from Catherine. Would you recommend any additional reading material for this fellow art history geek? Oh, I mean, <laughs> where, do we, where do we begin? I'm in the process of moving bookshelves here, so I would otherwise just grab stuff off the, uh, off the wall. But um, if I have to give you a quick recommendation uh, about Pompeii, I would pick up the books by Mary Beard, B-E-A-R-D. She is a uh, British art historian from Oxford. She is real, like, just so approachable and easy to understand while being uh, tremendously smart and interesting and well-learned. So I would pick up any of her books about Pompeii, The Fires of Pompeii, actually is one that I'm reading right now. Um, if you want to read a historical novel about Naples, I would recommend Susan Sontag's The Volcano Lover. It's actually about the Neapolitan Revolution. Uh, the beginning of it's a little dry. I will tell you this. The beginning of it, you're like, what? why did this girl recommend this book to me? But stay with it. <laughs> and it gets really, really good. It's very well researched, which is likewise a little dry at the beginning. It's a little too thorough. Um, gosh, there's so, there's so many books that I would recommend. But I would, yeah, start with Mary Beard. And um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll continue to think about that. I gotta, again, like I said, you should put a bibliography on the website. Um, let me see more of the questions here. Said I didn't learn all this prior to any of my three visits to Naples over eight years. Wow, that's awesome. I love Naples. It's my favorite place in the world. I feel so at home. The second I land there, I just feel 10 times more alive than I've ever felt any other place in the world. And as I'm sure you know, you can go to Naples and just eat and not learn anything. <laughs> it is a really rich experience. The food is, is the best. But yeah, of course, learning all this history it makes it all make sense. And you know, Naples seems like a jumble to a lot of people. It seems like a chaotic city but when you know the history and you can start to separate the layers and understand like oh okay this street where's all these thick, thin flat bricks this is the roman market and then there are 600 churches here because this was one of the wealthiest cities in in europe and in southern italy especially if you were a rich person you built a church and so there's so many churches and they were all built in this period which is why they're pink and blue and, and your eye begins to sort everything and it becomes even better um, is from Betsy. Hi, Betsy. Is there a specific period in art history that influenced your interest? I, um, I guess the Renaissance was my gateway drug. I actually um, went to undergraduate school for graphic design, and the idea was that this was a very practical, skills-oriented education. And I took my first art history class as, like, you know, one of my liberal arts classes, and I was just immediately like. This is what I want to do. <laughs> uh, but I didn't think I could because it didn't seem terribly practical. It's not. But uh, sometimes, you know, your path is yours and it will, it will work. So it wasn't until I was actually out of college working at a uh, internet startup in sort of the, the late 90s dot-com boom. It was 1999 when I graduated. And um, by 2001, right before 9-11, I was actually laid off from my job because of those tech market crash. And I said at that point, I'm going I can't get a job. I'm like one of a million, you know, 23 year old unemployed graphic designers in New York. I'm going to go to Italy and do what I want to do. And so that's, that's where I, that's how I got here. That's how I got to this live stream. <laughs> um, will you be offering specific uh, will you be offering sessions specific to traveling in Italy or visiting areas of Sicily, beginning to plan for a future trip? there once travel is safe again. Um, well, I mean, well, it's it's not gonna be like, a, you know, eat here, shop there, that kind of thing, but we will be focusing on specific parts of Sicily, starting with Palermo, and then we'll move into Eastern Sicily and the Greek temples uh, in 20, early 2021. But, um, you know, I, I consider that part of a trip, and also I would say like the interactivity part of it, you know, you can ask as many questions as you want, like whether it's live on the class or in the activity feed, and I'm gonna be answering everybody's questions. So that's the beauty of us having our own little world is that we can all ask and answer questions at will. And then, and then like other people might have expertise to share as well. So so that will, that will be part of it. And as far as travel planning goes, I mean, our property where the Food and History Food and Wine School is, uh, is called Borgo La Pietra. 
and is run by my cousins. And my cousin Ariana, who runs the office there, is also a licensed travel agent. And so she will, she is one of the hosts of the school and uh, she's in Italy, she lives in Italy. So she'll also be available to answer all sorts of questions and do trip planning for you and things like that if you like as well. All right, last shot for questions. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, guys. This is fun. I, I kind of <laughs> wasn't 100% sure how this would go. I've never really done um, a live stream on Facebook like this before, but I guess it should. I mean, I'm home. I should be doing these a lot more. So if you, again, if you have specific topics, area of it, areas of interest, questions, send them to me, and that will help me make these things more fun and more interesting. And if you are interested in joining us, our programming officially begins on September 10th. Just go to feastonhistory.com. You can sign up there. Again, you can do it monthly or annually if you'd like. And uh, you can also join us again on Tuesday night. Christian is going to be doing a preview of his course, Italian Wine for the 99. Um, and then I believe on Thursday after that, to schedule this, we're going to be doing another live stream, which is going to be all about the food. And I think I'm going to be making an eggplant parm for you if I can figure out how to make my New York City kitchen <laughs> uh, hospitable to live stream viewers. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful night and send me questions. Good night, guys.